starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Scott Shemwell, and with me today is my colleague, Jeff Brown. We would like to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to visit with us today as we launch a new series. Uh, we, Jeff and I have known each other for a number of years, and you see we represent two different organizations, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But together, we think we've got a unique set of skills where we can add value to your organizations by looking at, look at how do we work in an environment where most of us believe that the price of oil is in the current trading range and hope that it will get above $60 and stay there, probably uh, not going to happen. So we'd like to start this series, which we envision as being once a month in a format similar to this, and talk about how does your company return its cost to capital? So as we go through today, we'll talk a little bit about the two of us and our organizations. Um, look at the major challenges just as a stake in the ground. I think most of us know what those are. And just discuss how do we get a return on cost of capital. Uh, and I think Jeff will show you that in many cases, organizations do not. Uh, we'll round that up with a little discussion about operational excellence and how you can free up your capital and provide you with some tools at the end that will enable your success. So as you see, um, Jeff's um, CV here, he's got 30 years of experience in um, executive leadership and consulting, uh, gas power plants and pipelines, and has a, is author of The Shale Gas Revolutions, A Lawyer's Guide. Uh, he's an economist and financial analyst. Uh, Jeff, I guess, would you like to add anything? No, that's fine, Scott. I think that's uh, uh, that sums it up pretty well. Okay, great. And just briefly about myself, and we're going to make these slides and a video available to you, uh, so we won't get into this in any detail, but uh, as with Jeff, I've been over 30 years in the experience. I'm actually in the Houston metropolitan area, and I've worked with companies such as Halliburton and Oracle and have a, a process background, and there's plenty of information there about how you can get a hold of me and follow my various escapades if you see fit. So let's talk today about the major critical issues. We've seen a significant decline in the price of crude from the late last half of 2014 and has remained down. There has been a lot of discussion, particularly a year ago, where I saw hope that a strategy for the increase in the price of oil and gas would happen. We've seen large reductions in force, equipment stacks, et cetera, et cetera, the standard things that we see whenever there's a severe financial crisis in oil and gas. I want to skip to the third button. Um, we've done a lot of work around safety and the culture of safety around all the, the 4,500 companies that participate in the upstream sector. And I have talked with regulators um, from Bessie in particular, Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, and there's no relief from the regulators. They've been very clear that just because the price of oil is low does not give us relief on how we have to run our business in a safe and environmentally responsible manner. So it leads me back to the second bullet. Operational excellence is a focus. Now, it's a current buzzword, and you probably like a lot of buzzwords. It's got a lot of different definitions. We'll talk about one that we like. But there's a lot of pressure on management and technical staff. Moreover, the recent layoffs, there's been a significant loss in industry knowledge. I actually attended a session yesterday where one of the uh, presenters talked about the showed a graph of the significant loss and the fact that the senior people are not coming back and the, and the junior people may not have the experience necessary. And then finally, and Jeff will get into this in more detail, there's been significant movement in the capital markets, a lot of restructuring, bankruptcies. My opinion is we're starting to see the, the back half of that, but still the capital markets have reacted uh, quite se severely to the issues that this industry has had. So I'm going to turn this over to Jeff right now and, and let him talk about a study that he did um, and some discussion points on how he how we can how you can increase the return on your cost of capital. So um, I'll hand it over to you, Jeff. Okay, very good. Uh, well, it starts off with the Capital Stewardship Project. This is something that we launched uh, at the end of fiscal year 2014 to examine how the upstream North American ENP industry had performed with respect to how well it manages capital. 
And the asset test of a capital intensive business is covering its cost of capital. Either it earns enough to compensate investors and lenders for risking their money or it doesn't. So investors are asking, is capital allocated in support of core competencies? Have allocations expanded the company's enterprise value? Is cash management appropriate for the business? That is to say our dividends and reinvestment in line with growth opportunities and investor expectations. Is the capital structure correct for a capital intensive cyclical business such as oil and gas exploration and production? Is the capital deployed efficiently? Have cost overruns occurred? Are operating expenses competitive? And have there been costly operational mistakes such as the Macondo disaster in the Gulf of Mexico? So there are three steps to capital stewardship. One is allocation. It's the most important process in generating assets with a positive net present value. That is to develop and allocate capital to the most prospective uh, investment opportunities. The second is deploying that capital efficiently. And it's a close second, but it's just as critical. And third is the field of release operations. It's just as important as the others and is where uh, realizing net present value actually occurs. In this slide, we see the results of the first round of the capital stewardship project. We took information from Morningstar, an institutional grade uh, investment database, and we compared the top companies in the North American upstream on the basis of their return on invested capital compared to their weighted average cost of capital. In this graph, what you see is the uh, return on capital for the period in 2005 to 2015. So on the far left, you see those five green bars. Those are the companies that returned at least their cost of capital plus a premium. The, most, uh, the, the highest performer returned a 5% premium to cost of capital. The next group in blue are the contenders. And they return something close, uh, certainly uh, no less than 5% loss. And then you have the vulnerable and the struggling and the troubled. So it's pretty clear that as of uh, end of fiscal year 15, the North American upstream industry was doing a pretty miserable job of earning its cost of capital. But you could say, well, that's due uh, to prices. And yes, indeed, prices had an impact. But let's take a look at the end of fiscal year 14 in this graph. Same measures, but you can see that there were significantly larger number of companies that earned a premium to their cost of capital, approximately 16 of them did. Another 32 were in that contenders range. But again, the industry as a whole didn't do very well. And this is during the boom time. This is where we had the perfect storm of rising oil and gas prices, the shale revolution, reserve additions were going through the roof. And yet, in the North American upstream, things were not, companies were not performing as they should have. So um, what, uh, what, what does this imply? Well, taking a look at this slide, uh, the premium to fair value for the same companies. Basically what this is is comparing the market value of the uh, publicly traded companies to their fair value. That is the net present value of their reserves plus leasehold positions and other uh, ancillary assets. And you can see that as of the end of fiscal year 14, there were quite a number of the companies that were trading at a premium. Basically what this means is that the capital markets valued those companies as going concerns, as enterprises, more than just a collection of assets. They recognized the technical and leadership talent within those companies and said that that is worth paying a premium for. On the other hand, a little less than half sold at a big discount those are the companies that are vulnerable. Those are the ones that are ripe for a takeover. Probably the good, the better candidates for uh, bankruptcy. And in any event, they're not likely to survive over the long term. Now, when we look at the end of fiscal year 15, the picture is different. Certainly, 
the premia are certainly a lot smaller than they were at the end of fiscal year 14. But again, it's about the same number of companies that are recognized by the capital markets as having uh, a value, an enterprise value, a going concern value that exceeds the net present value of their assets. So how do they get there? Well, we've done a number of studies on uh, case studies on those top performing companies. And the things that we have found is there are three elements that give rise to uh, a successful uh, capital stewardship. First and foremost is people. Now, at this stage of the game, the industry is probably left with the ma majority of the people left in the industry are the real top performers. These are the people that have survived. They're the ones that have contributed. And so there's not a whole lot that can be done by way of changing people, although there is within the uh, realm of operational excellence a lot that can be done to develop those people. <clears throat> Strategy comes from this top leadership. What does management decide it's going to do? One of the interesting things we found out is that it's not an a genius strategy that gives rise to success. It's a good enough strategy, but the key is processes. How do you implement that strategy? What are the actions and tactics that management and the technical staff do to ensure that that strategy is, uh, is fulfilled? And when you get all of these pieces aligned, when you get the people, the process, and the strategy, you have a good outcome. And that's focused on those loyal stakeholders. Scott mentioned the regulators early on. I've been talking about the shareholders. There are the communities. There are a variety of other uh, uh, constituencies that have a stake in seeing that the oil and gas industry does its job well and does it profitably. So this is really the excellence, uh, the, the essence of operational excellence. So Scott, anything you wanted to add at this point? No, I think it's a good overview. The uh, I think it's one of the interesting things, Jeff, is that uh, even when even when we were in the boom times and the, the concept of quote unquote printing money uh, was alive and well in the oil and gas, there was still a significant number of companies that couldn't cross that hurdle. Uh, do you have any idea why that might be? Well, I would I would venture to say that it was really because they didn't have the good processes working for them. There's an example that we did in our case studies of two companies in the deep Alberta basin, Western Canada. They play in the same uh, geologic realm, uh, basically the same strategy. Seemingly good people, I mean their resumes read well, but what is really striking is that one of those companies is at the very top of the stars and another one is at the very bottom of the troubled companies. So here you have the same basic strategy, presumably good people, but it's the processes that aren't working. Somehow they're not able to execute their strategy and get everything aligned. And I think that really is kind of one of the most more stark examples of why it's important to have the operations really working well. You know, we've, we've been through a period where just about everything that can be done to wring costs out of a uh, out of a company has been done. They've squeezed the the service companies. They have reduced staff. They have closed offices. They've done all of the kinds of things that we have seen over the last 30 or 40 years. When companies get into trouble, they do everything they can to reduce costs, often at the risk of reducing capability as they're doing that. <clears throat> that game is over. That's all been done. Companies are continuing to be able to operate more uh, efficiently in the sense that they're able to add reserves at a lower finding and, op uh, finding and development cost. But we're at a stage where this industry needs to fundamentally look at its businesses front to back and top to bottom and identify ways that it can operate on an ongoing, sustainable basis at a lower cost and continue to do that. And there are some that have done that. There are a few companies that have been relentless in how they operate, and they are the examples of, uh, of operational excellence. 
Yeah, and that's a subject that we're going to talk about next. So, you know, I might add to that um, in my 30, 30 plus years experience, been through booms and busts. I've seen when, when the good times are rolling, the expense accounts are high, and people uh, talk about, well, it's, it's not important. It's not as important to manage costs because we're making money and we, we don't mind a little slippage. And then when the bus times happen, <clears throat> I've seen some ridiculous uh, behaviors to try and save even tiny amounts of money where the cost of, uh, of saving that money is high. And I might give a quick example. Uh, back in the, in the 90s, uh, we had to get moved from free coffee in the office to we had to pay for it. And uh, one of the um, administrative people put out like a church envelope system to manage the, uh, the collection of the money and actually move the coffee pot so she could see it, make sure people weren't stealing coffee, quote unquote. And so it's an example of we go from one end of silliness to the other in terms of our, our not just our capital, but our cash management. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's kind of a crazy way to live. And I agree with you. Uh, hopefully that world is, died a long time ago. And as we come, I don't believe we're going to go back to $100 oil anytime soon, if ever. Uh, for some reasons we'll talk about in a minute. But I think as we start to move to where, where we are aligned with the processes and strategies and people, as the slide shows, that we run the businesses more effectively on an ongoing basis as opposed to run, running from one extreme to the other. Okay, very good. Well, great. Thanks, Jeff. Great presentation and a great study. I've, I've seen that study and there's a, an immense amount of detail. must have taken you quite a long time to actually have done all that work. Well, technology is a great levelizer, and uh, like everybody else, when you're uh, in this kind of environment, you, you figure out ways to be efficient. There you go. But, uh, <laughs> I'm looking forward to round three that we will do sometime this spring once uh, annual reports are in mm -hmm. and we have uh, data for end of fiscal year 16. We'll see. Uh, see if there's anything different. In the meantime, we're continuing to do case studies on the top performers to see what it is they're doing uh, to, uh, uh, to shine. And develop a set of good, good or best practices that may be made available to folks as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, let me move on to the operational excellence. As you recall, Jeff mentioned um, operations as a major contributor to um, either your successful return on capital or your not so successful return. Uh, I always like to start with a definition, and this one comes from the Society of Petroleum Engineers, so it's very relevant to uh, to this audience and our daily activities. And it talks about a methodology, sustained operational standards in an environment of increased government regulations. Uh, consumers and communities are placing more demands on us. I think one of the one of the things I saw during Macondo. And I've lived in South Louisiana. It's a great place to live, and Cajun food is super. Uh, those folks were really upset when their beaches were getting um, torn up, and it wasn't California, it wasn't Florida. Uh, it was people who earned their living in oil and gas. So we as communities and consumers have a, a, a right to expect that these oil companies and the service providers operate in an excellent manner and protect our environment. And there's a number of um, NGOs or non-government non organizations out there. And these can be everything from the, uh, the various uh, lobbyists to environmentalists uh, and so forth and so on. So the operational excellence really helps an organization meet all of the requirements they need today in today's complex uh, environment. Uh, if you Google the word operational excellence, you'll see that it is what the current buzzword in in this industry and others as well. So now that we've got a nice little definition and this is what we want to do, uh, we'll talk a little bit about how, how do we do it. So the, there are six criteria to obtain and sustain operational excellence. And you see this comes from, the, from Bain and Company. Uh, if any of you are interested, you can email me and I can make this study available to you. It is, it is out on a, on a website. So let's just briefly go through. You've got to be a top performing company. Now, when you talk about asset performance, if you're an operator, we're certainly talking about the reserves. If you're a 
marine contractor or a drilling company. We're talking about your drilling rigs or your boats or your vessels, your trucks, etc. Uh, so you've got to get the best return on your assets that is available in the top 25%. Now, easy to say, hard to do. We know that. Immaculate reputation. We all know companies who are the gold standard for uh, work in their field, who we trust with our lives, literally, um, in some cases. We also know those companies that don't have an immaculate reputation, who we wouldn't give them a dollar if our life depended on it. And the company named Enron comes to mind as somebody who fits in that category. In terms of distinctive capabilities, what do we as an organization bring to the market that makes us unique, that is our differentiator, that makes us best of breed that no one else can do? That can be intellectual property, human capital, uh, capital from the capital markets, uh, any number of things, technologies, uh, et cetera, et cetera, that makes us different, enables us to differentiate ourselves from our, our companies. I would say, okay, if I'm an oil and gas producer, um, mid-sized company, how am I different than perhaps the guy next door to me in Houston, Texas that does the same thing and operating in the same play? Uh, you've got to have unique capabilities that differentiate from you from, from, from that organization. A high performance culture. The term high reliability organization has recently come into vogue in the upstream industry. Uh, it has been around for a while. And the high reliability, and we'll probably put together a session on that in the future, the high reliability organization really focuses on the fact that life in the field is complex. You cannot simplify it. You've got to deal with it. Uh, failure is possible, so you've got to plan for failure and have immediate ways to be resilient around it. Uh, one case that I've used in other presentations was the Ebola scare in, in Dallas a couple of years ago. If you recall, there was a couple of cases that came in from Africa. Then there was a few uh, uh, medical people that got it. It looked like it might spread around. And there was a lot of concern and there was a lot of discussion that the uh, the health community, and that would include the um, the government agencies as well as the hospitals, weren't performing well, very well. Well, in fact, they were very resilient, in my opinion because it didn't spread very much and it did not become um, a, a major health issue. So that was that's an example of when things go bump in the night, how resilient are you, how fast can you respond, and how well can you perform as a culture, of not just perhaps the company, but your ecosystem, which would be your suppliers and even your customers. World-class health, safety, and environmental capability. goes without saying these days, and I just mentioned it, that uh, we, we really – really have to operate in a manner that is um, good for the planet, good for our people. Uh, we don't want our sons and daughters to go to work, go out on an oil rig and not come home. Uh, we don't want our waters polluted. Uh, we don't want our air to where we can't breathe it. <clears throat> and finally, best in class processes and systems. Well, those of you with an IT background might think immediately, okay, well, that's a big, um, that's a big ERP. That's a big, um, uh, system that we put in place, um, asset management systems, perhaps supply chain. That's true, but as Jeff mentioned, we're really focused on the processes that are supported and enabled by these uh, IT and other technological systems. So to meet all of these six criteria, we'll get you into that um, class of world-class operational excellence. And a couple final points in this slide, as we've mentioned, uh, we believe that the commodity trading range, where it is right now, about $53 as of this recording, uh, is going to stay there. The uh, drilling rig count has already gone up. The shale guys are back in business. So there's a, a natural cap. Uh, and it's not just Scott and Jeff saying this. The um, Others believe it as well. I, I saw it at a conference last year where the, the feeling was, okay, well, if the cap is shale because shale can come back online real quick. And it becomes the so-called swing producer. Uh, and I guess we'll know about that in a, in a few years. But if that's the case, then we are living in a world where the commodity trading range is where it is. Uh, and, and as Jeff noted, some of us are still not able to perform in this current environment. And so if you look at what we've done, and I think Jeff mentioned this at the beginning of the presentation, we have stacked assets. We've sold assets. We've had reduction in force. 
We've done mergers and acquisitions. Uh, there's a number of capital market restructuring. They're, I think they're largely finished, but there's still a few that I'm aware of. And as Jeff talked about, the cost of capital. We can't lay off any more people. We can't stack any more equipment. Uh, at some point in time, the mergers and acquisitions don't make sense anymore. The, the strong players have probably been taken up right now, and the weak ones are probably never will be. So the only way out of this, in my opinion, is for us to run our business in the field better and keep our SGNA down to a minimum. So, okay, that's great. What do I get for that? Let's look at the value from operational excellence. I've got three bullets here that were taken from a McKinsey study. And again, if you're interested in this, I can, um, I can provide the links to it. It says world-class operational excellence can add up to 30% of your production asset base. What does that mean? In my opinion, and Jeff, you might want to chime in on this. I'm not the finance guy. That's your balance sheet. Up to 30% of your balance sheet. Uh, that's a huge number. We'll say you only get 10% of that or 5% of that. I suspect that's higher value than all the people that you've laid off. Any comments, Jeff? Yeah, that, I think that's that's right. And, and there are probably a couple of ways of of realizing that value. Um, one, uh, going back to the, the slides we looked at earlier, with uh, the premium that a company can sell for at, over its the net present value of its assets. Um, the market, the capital markets will recognize those companies that operate well. And if we saw mm -hmm. the highest premium was about, a five, well, at one point was 100% at the end of uh, 2014. At the end of 2015, it's, it's much lower than that. So essentially, a company could look to double its market value, even if it's already performing well, by realizing the full benefits of operational excellence. That's an enormous increase in the value of its stock. It's an enormous reward for the shareholders. And it certainly has benefits for the other constituencies in terms of better health, safety, security, and environmental protection. Well, thank you. And the, this next bullet, is one that's very disappointing to me. Um, as I said at the beginning, I've been here 30 plus years. In reality, it's probably closer to 40. And we still have a significant percentage of our costs in upstream resulting from poor project management. Uh, I remember reading an article, I think it was in the Oil and Gas Journal in the mid-1990s, talking about that something like 47% of all projects were uh, over budget and late. And here we are in the beginning of 2017. I believe this study was 2015. Uh, so 2015, some 20 years later, 80% of the costs of projects upstream are around poor project management. And so there's, a, again, a, a significant amount of not just your cost of your capital, but cash that you can take out of your, out of your system or cash that you can recover from your system if you can manage the project's time a little bit better. Um, our ORS software product, which is referenced in my um, overview, is designed specifically to help in this area. And again, we can take that offline if anybody's interested in that. We can talk about that or at another date. And finally, in the, the same study, almost up to 75% are engineering productivity constraints, change orders, last minute work, weak perform performance cultures, and broken learning curves. Well, we've talked about all the reduction in force this happened. I'm sure that in some places the morale is not very high. Uh, mergers and acquisitions. Uh, there's um, a major energy services uh, merger and acquisition process underway right now. Uh, I'm sure all of you know about it. I'm not going to mention the names. Um, but there are two very large multi-billion dollar organizations and I know both of them well. They are very different cultures in these organizations. So when that actually is accomplished, it may take years for the new entity to evolve to a new culture, and there's certainly going to be broken learning curves. Um, for example, on the 
learning curves is let's say that you work for a large company and um, you get laid off so you go to work for a smaller company doing uh, perhaps even the same job the culture and the learning curves and the differences between those two companies will make that individual uh, less product less productive for some period of time so how we manage these issues um, are really important but as you can see as we mentioned we're not talking about small incremental changes in the value proposition. Uh, we're talking about significant changes in order of magnitude of what the value of your organization can be uh, by operating your business at a world-class level, which means meeting all six of the criteria that we just mentioned. And, and of course, it's hard to do, but it's not impossible. Uh, and there are lots of tools that are outside the, the time frame that we have today that we can talk offline about to help you realize these um, th these value propositions. And I guess before I leave this slide, Jeff, do you have any, any, any further comments on this? Yeah, when we were uh, planning this uh, presentation and, and talking through it, one of the things that you pointed out that I thought was very significant is the cultural idea that every new oil and gas field is unique and therefore requires a top to bottom brand new design of all of the uh, wellhead equipment, topside facilities, and it, it just isn't true. I mean, I, I think you've, you had some good comments on how many uh, change orders you had seen in your work uh, at, as, at the service companies. Maybe you could comment a little bit about that. Yeah, the, there's, there's a couple things. I, I was on a very large project. Uh, we spent a long time getting ready for this. And in fact, it took us a couple of years to actually win the project. And there were several companies involved. Uh, we had a change order on the very first day of the project. And they had, we had spent literally tens of thousands of hours and significant task forces in place around the world to try to minimize that. Uh, the other thing I've seen is uh, I'm, I'm not a safety guy, I'm more of a process guy, but because of the Macondo uh, incident, it became clear to, to a few of us back in 2010 that there were going to be some significant changes to the way operations was done. Uh, and having spent most of my, my career on the service side, I looked at, okay, how can, we, how can we help affect that? So we did uh, a lot of work and even wrote a book on the systemic safety culture. And what I just I didn't discover, I knew it, that as Jeff said, we'd go out there and redesign an offshore facility, we'd redesign a rig, we'd redesign over and over again on the basis of we're different, this one's different, et cetera, et cetera. Well, there's a significant effort underway right now uh, to standardize on processes being driven by the uh, American Petroleum Institute uh, through the Center for Offshore Safety for the offshore group. Uh, ISO is, is more important in the United States now than it's ever been. Uh, and part of the thinking that I've heard is, okay, if you're, if you're working in Australia for a large company and then you're transferred to the North Sea and then you're transferred to the Gulf of Mexico, then you're transferred to Alaska, then you're transferred to the uh, uh, Far East again, every time that individual engineer or manager goes to a different set of processes within the same organization, and, and we know that operators are a lot of joint ventures and partnerships, so there are some differences. But there is an effort to harmonize and standardize on these processes wherever possible because it impacts on this productivity constraint that the people that are designing stuff and, and, and fixing things in the field work. There's a, one of the issues with Macondo, uh, and there's a book out on this, uh, Deepwater Horizon, a Systemic Approach. It is my understanding from reading the book that the people at the desktop engineering in Houston were making changes to the workflow based on the, the behavior of the well, and that wasn't being completely transmitted to the folks in the field and to the service companies. They were all having to do the work. So effectively, you had two different processes going on, and they, um, I don't know if it contributed to the problem or not. I'm not an expert in that area, and I don't. I, by disclosure, I do not know anybody that was directly involved in that. But uh, it's it was clear from the perspective of that book uh, that this third bullet was significantly impacted. 
uh, contributed to poor productivity, and particularly when things are going. And it was not during the blowout itself, but it was in preparation in the, before the blowout when people knew that things were not going well and they were trying to make some changes. So we, we could, um, you know, Jeff, maybe this is another, another, um, another one in the series. We could spend two or three hours just on this subject alone. Yeah, I agree, and uh, and I think that's one of the things that we'll want to hit upon harder uh, as we go further and deeper into this topic. But it uh, just kind of as, as an overview, it surprises me that for as long as Six Sigma and Lean and total quality uh, kinds of movements have been around, how little of that has been adopted by the upstream oil and gas industry. Uh, there's an organization that Scott and I are affiliated with called the Total Quality Institute that has taken the essence of all of these uh, fine movements and has condensed them down to the point where it's much more accessible to smaller organizations to implement these kinds of practices within their own operations. And one of the things we hope to do through this series is make that technology available uh, to uh, uh, the upstream oil and gas industry and help them do a couple of things. Reduce cycle time. That's the start from spud to first production of a well. Uh, to reduce variability in outcomes so that it's very predictable as to what kind of a uh, of returns uh, uh, investors could expect to see. And that, by the way, has a big impact on a company's cost of capital. If you have a lower variability in outcomes, you have lower risk, and therefore your cost of capital uh, is reduced. And you realize a greater market value at the end of the day for that. So uh, we definitely want to want to pursue this uh, much further in uh, future um, uh, webinars. Okay, great. Well, let me move on to the to the next slide. But just in in closing on this this value proposition, um, and again, outside of this particular presentation, but we if you're interested, you can get a hold of us. We we can document these numbers um, and have put together a, a value proposition model for this that's usable by um, our clients to put these to take these percentages and turn them into real numbers for that your particular company. And what we've seen repeatedly is the uh, when you put it to the numbers that are mine, not some arbitrary generic practices, but my numbers, the the value can be dramatic. And and we can show you how to to show and, and convince management that the value proposition is there if you behave in certain ways. Uh, covering all the soft variables, et cetera. Well, let me move along to the, to the next steps. And we, we appreciate everybody's time today, and we promise to keep it under an hour. I think we're about 40 minutes at this point. One of the things that we like to do is leave something like this with an action plan. Uh, we've, we've asked you to spend an hour or so of your time to visit with us, and it's fine to hear about how all this stuff can happen, but what about me? How, how do I get one of these things? So we will be providing you a one-page form, uh, pretty straightforward. We'd like you to comment uh, on your current challenges in the two areas that we've discussed today, uh, issues around the return on cost of capital at your organization, um, why you think you might not be getting it, uh, any any uh, things that you think you can talk about there, and then um, your comments about operational excellence. How do you stack up against those six criteria? I guess, Jeff, do you want to make a comment about what kinds of information they might want on the cost of capital on the little one-page form? Well, problem? basically, if, um, it's the, uh, if you're a publicly traded company, we can, we can calculate your cost of capital and identify where you are on the uh, array that we showed uh, earlier in one of the slides. Uh, a private company will probably have to get uh, that information in a uh, in an interview session, but essentially, what we'd like to start with are uh, financial statements uh, to the extent that you're you're willing to share those with us. Okay, great. And for for that, we'll we will provide um, a one on one, not not in a group. Each one will be private. Uh, one hour of consultation uh, in a format similar to this, where we can work through the specific challenges that you have. And uh, we will give you our 
best uh, input as to how you might go forward with that um, and um, see if we can hopefully add some value to maybe perhaps the second hour of your time. So today we looked at the major challenges that the industry has, the uh, belief that the price point for the trading range is where it is is not going to get significantly higher and we've got to do business in that environment. We have to manage our cost of capital much more effectively than most organizations have even during the good times. Um, we believe that operational excellence is one high level high value contributing factor to that and going forward to enabling your success uh, we're willing to work with you uh, in a pro bono for an, for an hour of your time uh, to address the problems that you have, not the generalized problems that we talked about today. Um, any additional comments, Jeff? No, I think that pretty well sums it up, Scott. I think that uh, to the extent that uh, this has stimulated some thinking on the part of the participants or those that might see this subsequently, uh, that there are some things that you can do to make a difference in your own organizations, even though you may not be in the C-suite, everybody within the organization can have an impact on return on invested capital through operational excellence. And that's what we're really about here is empowering people to do that. That's a very good point. In fact, that addresses a question that's been raised. Of this. I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a chief financial officer. How, how can I help? And I think you just ex explained it very nicely. The, uh, the, the tools that we did not go into today because of time constraints uh, that we can show you later can enable you as an individual contributor or part of a task force uh, to uh, bring to the attention of decision makers how to go forward with this. And, you know, having been in the field myself, uh, and, you, and you hear this all the time, it's the people in the field that know what's going on. Uh, I've, been, I've been a suit in the, in the corner office as well, and uh, that, that individual does not know nearly as much about what's going on in the field as those of you who are still at that stage in your career. So having said that, uh, the value proposition for all of this uh, is available to, to all of us, and it doesn't have to be, I'm not, su I'm not suggesting we don't save cash, but it doesn't, it can be more than the silly little discussion I had about coffee as a way of trying to save money for a Fortune 500 organization. Um, so I think with that, we'll bring this to a close. Uh, here is our contact information. Uh, feel free to... Um, contact either one of us. As I mentioned at the beginning, Jeff and I have known each other, I don't know, pretty close to 10 years, I guess now, Jeff. Yeah, and, that's about right. Yeah. And um, he's in he's in the, um, the Washington, D.C. Uh, metropolitan area of Virginia, I believe, and I'm in the Houston area. Um, so we've worked together on a number of things and I um, think we, we bring together a capability that can add value to the industry. So any, any final comments, Jeff? Oh, I think that uh, uh, is a good way to sum it up. I would just say that uh, with Scott's uh, software and the ability to automate business processes dovetails well with the kinds of consulting at the cultural level and uh, the leadership level that I do. And so uh, together I think we make a pretty strong team and not to turn this into a total advertisement, but uh, one of the things that I think we're uh, well equipped to do is to help individuals within organizations have an impact to achieve higher performance. Great, and thank you. And just to summarize, um, this material will be available uh, shortly and the video will be out on our, our YouTube uh, channel uh, soon as well. And all participants will be provided with a, a form if you choose to fill it out. Um, we, Jeff and I will be happy to work with you, as we mentioned, on an online consultation to see if we can uh, help you get started on this path to um, a better return on your cost of capital and, um, and world-class operational excellence. So with that, thank you very much and uh, have a good day.